Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guten Tag. Uh, no, guten Tag, guten Tag. Dankeschön. Uh, ich habe keine Deutsch und ich muss sprechen in English. I'm so sorry. That's as fast as I can go. So thank you very much. And can I first congratulate Fabersoft on their 30-year birthday? And uh, well done. Happy birthday. Thank you. And, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here to join the celebrations in such a wonderful place. I was saying to Katrina earlier, I can't believe this is working. This is such a nice place to be and the conversations are so interesting. So, um, because I've got the clock ticking here, let's get straight into it. And Tarek's given a little bit of the perspective of what I want to share with you, which is what can someone like me, who's a neuroscientist, say that would help um, folk like yourselves in the software industry? Well, what I want to do is to show you that really we have a lot to think about a lot of overlap, because as you can see, I hope from this little picture, um, my concern is as a neuroscientist that we underestimate how sensitive the brain is to the environment, and therefore we have to be very careful when we think about the environment in terms of the threats and opportunities it will pose to our brains, and hence to the workforce and the workplace and your customers um, and your interpersonal relationships both professional and private. So I love starting with this picture. Um, I do apologize if, since you've just had um, brunch, um, that it is a rather, for those of you of a delicate disposition, uh, but it does remind me, and I like to start with this, of when I first at Oxford um, dissected a human brain. And can I check that, uh, there, oh, is there one else in the room has ever dissected a brain, just in case you're all, you're all ex-neurologists or something? Okay, so. Um, as you can see in the picture, the person is wearing gloves, um, as was I, because that's what you have to do to protect your brains from the formalin in which the brain is immersed. But I remember thinking, um, if a bit of brain tissue dislodged and got under my fingernail, would that be the bit somebody loved with? Can you have love under your fingernail, do you think? Yeah, could you have a memory under your fingernail? Or could you have a habit like biting your fingernail? Under your fingernail, yeah. So uh, as I, I, this is what happens when you invite neuroscientists, you see. They come up with these kind of strange ideas and horrible pictures like this. But nonetheless, this horrible picture, this gory thing, is the essence of what you are. And what is amazing is the diversity of each and every one of us. And even if you are a clone, that's to say an identical twin with identical genes, you're still unique, you're still special, and no one is like you. For the 100,000 years we've stalked this planet, no one will ever be again. And it's not because of your heart or your lungs or your liver, because these can be exchanged nowadays if they become diseased, but your brain, that is the essence of making you the unique individual you are. And what is the basis of that? One could ask, therefore, what is the basis of the human mind? Why is it that, let's say, a goldfish doesn't have a great personality, but we do? If your kids had a goldfish and it died, you could get another goldfish and they'd come back home and they wouldn't know any different. Whereas cats and dogs, you couldn't really do it, and you certainly couldn't do it, even if they wanted you to, with their brothers or sisters. Because, because the more sophisticated we become, the more we become individuals, and we are the superlative example of individuality. It's why we occupy more ecological niches than any other species on the planet. We don't run fast, we don't see particularly well, we're not strong, but gosh, what we do is we learn, we adapt. And I want to suggest to you that if you have individual experiences, if you adapt to those individual experiences, guess what, you become an individual. So let's look then at how this happens, how we develop a mind. So, when you're born, this is the human brain, and the blobby bits are the brain cells, but I'd like you to focus on the stringy bits, which are the connections. And very rapidly in life, you can see at three months, 15 months, look what's happened to your brain in the first two years of life. The growth of the human brain postnatally is not due to an increase in blobby bits, in brain cells. No, the connections between them. And it's this growth of connections after birth that is sensitive to being upgraded, strengthened, changed by every moment you are alive. This is something called plasticity. It doesn't mean to say the human brain is made of plastic. It comes from the Greek plastikos to be molded. And we're going to look at one or two examples of the human brain with plasticity. And this is a classic one that I'm going to show you next, involving 
London taxi drivers. Now, those of you, I'm sure many of you, have been in London and taken a black cab, a London cab. If you have, you will realize this is a very unusual photo because the driver is smiling. <laughs> normally, normally, they like moaning most of the time. And this is even more unusual, the passenger is also smiling. <laughs> Usually, so savor this because you'll never see it again. Right, now, the interesting thing about London taxi drivers is they have to pass a very ominous test called the knowledge where they have to remember all the streets of London and how you navigate with the one-way systems so that when you come to your exam, the knowledge, the examiner can ask you, how do you get from A to B? You have to recite how they will do that without recourse to a manual. So they have a huge, this is the point, they have a huge burden on what's called their memory, their spatial and working memory. Now, in an ingenious classic study now some time ago, they decided, the scientists, to scan the brains of London taxi drivers to see if they were any different from normal human beings. And what they found was an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which relates to memory. And you can see it here on the left, indicated, and there on the right, you can see how beautiful it looks under a microscope. What they found was that the hippocampus was bigger in the brains of London taxi drivers than in ordinary mortals. Um, this is a fact not lost on London taxi drivers. Next time you take a taxi, say you've heard of the hippocampus, because they all have. They're very proud of this. Yeah? Um, and it's not that having a big hippocampus predisposes you to being a London taxi driver, because the difference is greater for the longer they've been driving. So this is an example of plasticity. Now, how does that happen? How does experience change physically your brain? And that's what we need to address next. And we do so by now making a brief excursion into the rat world and changing their environment. Now, what you can't do in a rat is ask them to drive a taxi. Obviously, you can, but it won't get you very far. So what you do with a rat, and this is from my own lab, is you change their environment. And this is a so-called enriched environment. Now, enrichment for a rat doesn't mean to say they come to this lovely place just outside of Vienna and have a wonderful time staying up all night with their colleagues, um, as you're going to all do tonight. I'm very impressed by that, by the way. No, this is the equivalent of a Fabersoft gathering for a rat. Yeah? <laughs> so here they are having a lovely time. Um, as you can see, they look so happy. They know they're not in the control group because um, rats are highly exploratory creatures and they love um, interacting and exploring things. So this is a so-called enriched environment compared to the inevitable controls who are kept in a much simpler ordinary home cage. And when you look at the brains of these two different animals, look at an isolated brain cell, this is what you see. I'm aware you won't have seen a picture like this before. The blobby bit in the center is the main part of the cell and I'd like you to focus on the branches. And if you look at the branches of the cell, compare these poor controls with these guys, I hope you can see the branches are more extensive. OK? Now, why is this interesting or important? Well, I'm sure many of you do sport, and you know that you use it or you lose it. The more you exercise, the more your muscles will get stronger and more effective. And if you don't exercise, they get very weak and they atrophy, they get smaller. And so it is with the brain. The more you make your brain work, for example, driving a taxi, the more uh, so the area of the brain concerned will seem to get bigger. And the reason it gets bigger is that the individual brain cells, rather like your muscles, have grown, but they've grown branches. And by growing branches, you are increasing the surface area. And by increasing the surface area, you can now just physically and simply make more connections. So to recap, a stimulating environment for rats or taxi drivers or you means that your brain cells in the relevant part of your brain will get bigger because they will work harder, they will grow branches, and therefore they can make more connections. Now, why do we want to make more connections? Back to humans. I want to suggest to you that this helps you understand things. It gives you a personalized meaning over time. Think of something like this. For a baby, this is a gold shiny thing that they would just put in their mouth. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a gold shiny thing, probably quite attractive because of its sensory properties. But as the weeks turn to months, turn to years, as the child has experiences with one of these, they will learn it's something that goes on fingers. They will then learn the name for the thing. 
They'll also learn that a gold shiny thing, unlike other rings, only goes on one finger under certain circumstances. So they will learn that if they see someone with one of these, it says something about them. It means something that is not apparent from the intrinsic sensory properties of the object alone. Then they might, when they are older, have one of their own. And this object might trigger so many associations and personal connections, it could have a value to them and importance to them, irrespective of the monetary value. And then, sadly, they might go from the honeymoon through to the divorce. Now it's the most bitter thing, the most negative associations. Yeah? And all these complex associations, what's changed? Not the object, it's what's gone on here that's changed. It's the connections. So connections in the brain help you personalize the world. We, in science speak, we say you go from sensory, the sensory world, to cognitive, from the Latin cogito, I think. Similarly, connections can help you with something like this. In case you don't recognize it, this is a ghost. There's an English ghost. Now, say I'd come on looking like this today, I doubt anyone would have been very frightened, but if you were a two-year-old, or indeed if you were someone with dementia, with Alzheimer's, you would be very frightened. Why is that? It's because as you curate these lovely connections, you become a more and more personalized individual human being. But sadly, with Alzheimer's disease, and it is a disease, it's not a natural consequence of aging, if you are sadly a victim of such a disease, gradually those connections are dismantled. So very sadly, the person goes back in time. They recapitulate childhood and then infancy. And so like an infant, they cannot evaluate the world with the checks and balances that are normally the birthright and the privilege of the adult human. Now, like a small child, they have to evaluate it on face value, on the sensory properties alone. And if it is novel, as this is, it's potentially life-threatening, so you are obviously frightened. So what connections do is they liberate you from that. They enable you to navigate the world and look beyond face value. You can look beyond the press of your senses to have a personalized association, an understanding, a meaning. Okay, so here you are living your life. This is downtown Oxford. We still dress like this. Um, and everyone, everyone in this picture is like everyone in this room. Everyone has a unique trajectory in time and space. We call it a life. Everyone has a past that informs the current moment that you are in. And I want to return to that, this extended present, where really this present is informed by all your previous personalized unique experiences that will enable you to plan for the future, hopefully a long way off before your death. So we are used to having a beginning, a middle, an end, a past, a present, and a future. And this linearity is really important. It's something that I think we're losing, and that's going to be the theme that I'm going to come back to over and over again. Suffice it to say, this is your story. It's why we like stories. It's your life story. And the more you have a life, the more personalized your brain will become, which is why as we talk, we get old, we talk about wisdom. And all of this, this identity that is yours and yours alone is due to the connections in your brain of which you have up to 100,000 on any one brain cell. Okay, so we can define the mind then not as some airy, fairy alternative to the squalor of the physical brain, no, it is the personalization of your physical brain through the unique dynamic configurations of the connections of your brain cells that are in turn driven by your unique experiences. That is how we're going to define the mind. Okay, so two. This is, I hope, not going to raise too much objection or contention, and it's a very short section, that the 21st century is unprecedented. Let's have a think about that. Um, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have seen signs like this. This now is normal. Here you have people obsessed with the screen. This is one of the most scary ones, as you have small children. The American Pediatric Academy has said no child should have any screen exposure until they're two, at the very earliest. And then the scariest one of all, unless you have shares in Price Fisher, is that for potty training. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is, this is a new, yeah, it's, it's, for those of you at the back, it's a potty with a screen. So when you're being potty trained, you can you know, still not um, lose a moment of screen time. Okay, 
So many people say to me, um, well, surely it's always been like this. There's always been technologies. Um, and people like you should join the Amish, you know, um, that really we've had the printing press and, you know, people debated the problems of reading and what books would do. We've had the car and we've had the television and every and people like you, you technophobics, you know, you always um, had problems with this. I say no, this is not technophobia, this is a different world. When we had the television, for example, first came out, people still ate together. They still went shopping in real life. They still played games face to face. They went dating face to face. And they worked as a group. Now, all those things can be replaced by a screen. So you can get up in the morning and do all those activities, then go to sleep and not have met anyone else. And if we're saying the human brain, as we are, is exquisitely sensitive to the environment, and that is the environment, how can it not follow that we will think and feel in different ways? And what we have to do is to explore whether we like this or not, what it will mean, and what they are. And so you can see what a profound issue it is when we look at how the screen now, as the major environment, what could it be doing to our brains? OK, so what we're going to do now in the third section um, is look at how the brain could be changing. And I think what's really important is people often say, are computers good or bad? Is the screen good or bad? Implying that it's a unified single activity. And of course it isn't. Because now, instead of it just being a technology, it's a whole life. It's a parallel life. And instead of it being a means to an end, as other technologies were, it is now an end in itself. And like all aspects of life, it is multifaceted. So we can talk about gaming, we can talk about social networking, and indeed search engines, and unpack the issues that relate to each of those things. So let's start with gaming um, and the effect of addiction. And every time you see that blue strip, I know it might be hard for you at the back, that is a peer-reviewed scientific paper, which you could look up. So most of the time, I'm not using anecdotes, I'm actually citing um, properly refereed papers. So the first one is on addiction, and that's a very good review of addiction. Um, and this was from a while ago, one of our papers, um, where they were concerned with children who love video games have brains like gamblers. Interesting notion. Incidentally, now the World Health Organization has determined that uh, internet addiction disorder is a genuine medical condition. Okay, so what was this about? Well, on the bottom right, you can see, I hope, a section of the brain, and those of you with good eyesight or at the front, I hope you can see a yellow blob at the center of the brain at the bottom. This yellow blob was highlighted in a brain scan because it was enlarged in video gamers and in gamblers. So they had the same thing going on. They had an enlarged part of the brain. Now, this part of the brain normally releases a chemical that you will have all heard of. Um, but in gamblers and in, in people with uh, the video game obsession, it's bigger. And so therefore, more of that chemical is being released. What is that chemical? Well, I'm going to hold you in suspense. So this chemical underlies excitement, arousal. It underlies addiction. All drugs of addiction, irrespective of their primary chemical target, will ultimately release this chemical. And moreover, this chemical underlies reward pathways. We know this because in rats implanted in a certain area, when they are stimulated and this chemical is released, they will press a bar to stimulate that area rather than take food, rather than eat. And this is the, that's a reward in case you haven't had one recently. So this hardworking chemical underlies arousal, addiction, and reward. And you'll have heard of it. It's called dopamine. OK, so why are we talking about dopamine now? Well, it's enhanced in people that are playing video games and in gamblers. And it's like a fountain in the brain. So it sits in a very primitive part of the brain. It has many functions, not least it's deficient in Parkinson's disease, so it's related to movement. But what we're going to look at is the fact that it inhibits a frontal part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. You don't have to worry about the names. Just think of the frontal part of the brain. Now, why is this relevant to addiction? Well, let's have a think about that. This frontal part of the brain, shown here in turquoise, um, is exaggerated in humans, even compared to chimpanzees. It's 33% in the human brain, only 17% in chimps. So it's pretty sophisticated. And like all um, 
issues in biology, you often find that things that are late in evolution are then also late in individual development. We say um, ontogeny reflects phylogeny. That is to say that this prefrontal cortex, which is very late in evolutionary terms, is exaggerated only in humans. It only becomes fully active in children in their late teenage years or their early 20s. Those of you with teenage children might pay particular attention to what I'm about to say as to what happens uh, when you don't have a fully functioning prefrontal cortex. Okay, so this is one group of people um, who are suffering from an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex. You will notice not only are they gambling, but they are, they've got a weight problem. Okay, and these are the peer-reviewed papers showing that in people with a high body mass index, that's to say um, people who are heavy relative to their height, that they have lower activity in that frontal part of the brain. Moreover, obese people are more reckless in gambling tasks. I will put all this together in a moment. So we have people who are large and gambling recklessly. People with schizophrenia also have an, as you can see here, have an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex. So what we know about schizophrenia, which is a complex mental condition, is that it's comparable to children in that both are easily distracted, both have short attention spans, neither can interpret proverbs. If you say to a schizophrenic or a child, what does it mean people who live in glass houses mustn't throw stones? They will say something like, if your house is made of glass and I throw a stone, your house will break, which is of course true, but it's missing the whole point. And both have underfunctioning prefrontal cortex. So let's put these things together. How, what's the common factor in these different situations? Well, anyone who eats knows the consequences of eating. But the thrill of the food, the momentary taste of the food, overrides the consequences. I don't want to say trumps anymore. So overrides the consequences that you're going to put on calories. And anyone who gambles knows the consequence of gambling. But for compulsive gamblers, the thrill of the moment, the ro roll of the, the dice, the circulating roulette wheel, the horse past the finishing post, that overrides the consequences you may lose your money. And with schizophrenia, if you look at this series of paintings, you can see top left, I hope, a cat. Bottom right, no one would recognize that as a cat. Now, what's happened here? This might be the very clue that we need to try and understand this. I would suggest to you the cat is a cognitive pattern. You can understand that is a cat. You can recognize it as a cat. Bottom right, it's purely sensory. So just as in normal development, we go from the sensory way of processing the world to the cognitive, here you're going back in time. You're going from cognitive to sensory. And what happens with people who have an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex, for whatever reason, is that the senses are dominating over the consequences, over the cognitive, over the personal. So let's think about that a little bit more. This is from a Greek vase. I don't know if anyone did Greek, but you may be familiar with the play by Euripides, the Bacchae, which is shown in this picture, where this poor king Pentheus, and there he is in the middle, is about to be torn apart by these wine-crazed women. Who are, you can see how crazed they look. They are worshipping the wine god Dionysus, so beware. And what happens is he doesn't heed the advice of a prophet who says you need a balance in life. He tries to suppress them, and he gets torn apart by these women. Now, the reason I'm showing you this from 500 BC is because even then, the ancient Greeks were aware that sometimes people wanted to have a sensational time. Now, I gather in German there's no direct translation of having a sensational time. But for me, it's very appropriate that when you're talking about having a good time, you're relating it to your raw senses. If I said to you, let's go out and have a cognitive time, no one's going to come. Well, that's what you're having now. Hard luck. You're having a cognitive time right now. But we do talk, I don't know if it's the same in German. Do you talk in German about letting yourself go? Yeah, letting, blowing your mind? Yeah? The very word ecstasy in Greek, ecstasis, is to stand outside of yourself. So here we have people who've let themselves go. These people are not worried about their mortgages. They're not worried about their exam results. They are in the thrill of the moment. And this is for my Australian friend here. This is from northern Queensland, where you could have hovercraft fun rides and be totally out of control. That was the selling point, to be totally out of control. Now, we're all familiar, well, I think we all are, with wine, women, and song. 
or the modern equivalent, drugs and sex and rock and roll. We spend a lot of time on those things. And they all have something in common, whether it's drugs or sex or um, hovercraft fun rides or dancing. They all have one thing in common, which is you are denying your sense of self. You are the passive recipient now of your senses. You are letting the senses come in and you are suspending access to those carefully curated brain connections because your environment now is so strongly sensory as here, or uh, disco, techno, 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 like this, where there's the beat of the music and things are happening so fast, or you've taken agents that will impair the functioning of your connections. So basically, it's been ever thus with people. And we can talk about two basic modes, meaningless and meaningful. So here, the prefrontal cortex under functions, here it's fully functional. We can talk about strong feelings versus thought, sensory versus cognitive, here and now living in the moment versus the past, the present, and the future. External stimuli dominating as opposed to internal stimuli. If a child drops an ice cream and bursts into tears, you can say, oh, look at the birdie, and the kid forgets the ice cream, looks at the birdie. If you have an adult in tears and you say, oh, look at the birdie, Nothing will, well, they'll be a bit rude to you, I think, probably, um, because they're driven by an inner narrative. So for this mode, it has little meaning. It is what it is. Think of the wedding, think of the wedding ring. It's just a gold shiny thing. Here, again, personalized meaning, think of the wedding ring. Here you have a reduced sense of self. You are not self-conscious. You're conscious, but you're not self-conscious. Here, you have a strong sense of identity, the past, the present, and the future, the linearity, as you are linking your immediacy with what you think and what you plan. Um, here, there's no time or space. If you have damaged the prefrontal cortex, you can get something called source amnesia, which is not normal amnesia, but it's um, where you only have generic memories. You can't remember the episodes, the specific time or place. Here, of course, we have clear time and space references. This is mainly infants and children. This is adults. And as well as having an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex when you're a kid, on top of that, just to ram it home, just to make sure this happens, you have the biggest surge of dopamine in your brain you will ever have, as opposed to us. So that's why I say you might recognize the left profile. Um, but my view is that now with video games, one is skewing that disproportionately, such that one can have intense stimulation of the screen, which will mandate a fast response. It's very vivid. This will make you very excited, so lots of dopamine is released. This will therefore underlie reward-seeking addictive behavior, which means that more dopamine is released. This inhibits your prefrontal cortex. So now you're in a mindset of childhood schizophrenia obesity, where the common theme, the overriding theme, is to seek sensation rather than cognition. Where are you most likely to find that? From the screen, and away we go. Right, just to show how this could be the way that we're going, I, I love this picture. I'm sure the person will be a professor one day. I'll be showing this, and there'll be a professor on the front row. Um, is this is a paper um, published several years ago now in the very prestigious High Impact Journal of Science. So again, a proper... And what they asked uh, these young people to do was just to sit still for 10 minutes or so. That was the study. And this is what they found. In 11 studies, we found that participants typically did not enjoy... They didn't enjoy spending six to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but think. Horror of horror. They enjoyed doing mundane external activities much more. And this is the key thing. Many preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves instead of being left alone with their thoughts. Yeah. Many people seem to prefer, most people seem to prefer doing something rather than nothing, even if the something is negative. So this suggests to me a new mindset. It's a mindset where you must have constant input. Unlike us, you have to have a constant sensory drive because you can't, there's nothing inside. There's nothing that will keep you going inside. So let's have a think about that when we now look at social networking. With social networking, as you might know in real life interaction, words have only 10% of impact. Eye contact is a really important skill that has to be learned by rehearsal. Body language, how to interpret it. Voice, you don't have to speak a language to know how someone's feeling and pheromones, which are those chemicals that uh, you say, oh, I, I, we really hit it off. I don't know why we just hit it off. Or I don't know, the chemistry wasn't there. And of course, the biggest minefield of all, which is physical contact. I remember when my dad died a few years ago, someone just put their arm around me, and that was more meaningful and important and helpful than a hundred words could have ever been. Now, the issue here, these are essential for interpersonal relationships, interpersonal communication. 
And yet, eye contact, body language, voice, pheromones, physical contact are not available on Facebook. So if you have someone born in this century who is offered Facebook from the earliest opportunity to communicate, bearing in mind how aversive and difficult it is to speak to someone face to face when you don't have those skills, this is what's going to be like. This is not an advert for Pepsi, but look, these kids are not looking each other in the eye, they're not communicating, they're in a cyber world, a different world. So small wonder that there's been a link between autistic type behavior where people have problems in interpreting um, what people are feeling and thinking um, because there's a link between atypical brainwave responses in problematic face recognition that's characteristic of autism and heavy internet users. There's a link between the autistic spectrum and an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex where you take the word very literally. A link between early screen experiences and the later development of autism. A link between autistic conditions and the appeal of autism. Now, why should autistic people enjoy being on the screen? I'll suggest it's because the playing field is level. Because when we're online, we're all in the same situation. We are not interpreting body language. We are not depending on interpersonal skills. We're all in the same boat, which is why perhaps someone with autism feels more comfortable. There's a link between autistic spectrum disorder and compulsive video game use. Um, and this was shown here. What a surprise. There's been a drop in empathy over the last 30 years, particularly marked in the last 10. So why is this? Well, we can now talk about virtual autism and increasingly, people are aware that um, it's not that you are autistic, but you have autistic-like behaviors. And you can see, again, two publications here. Now, the good news, the good news is it can be reversed because the brain is only good at what it rehearses. And so in this particular study, what they did was to um, take children and split them into two, and half were confiscated all mobile devices and sent to a summer camp like this, and the other half were left as they were, and as you can see, the conclusion of this is that five, door, five days of outdoor education improve their pattern skills and nonverbal emotion cues, even within five days. So you are only as good as what you are experiencing and doing. So now let's get to identity itself. And I think it's, I love this history of blogging, where in uh, 99, I just have to tell someone about this thing my cat did today. 2004, oh my god, cat pictures. YouTube, 2005, moving cat pictures, and then that pinnacle of civilization that's now been going for 10 years. Um, 1 p.m., my cat just sneezed. 102, cat hasn't sneezed again. 404, cat hasn't sneezed recently, getting worried. Yeah? And I think there's many, there's, we only have to look at the President of the United States to know uh, it is easy to give a flood of consciousness without necessarily thinking about what you're <laughs> saying. Anyway, um, so this speaks to the fact that now um, we see ourselves very much as brands. We see ourselves as having to share everything with people. Now, why would we want to do this? What, what's the something about social networking? Well, no one likes to be lonely. And loneliness, anyway, is bad for the health. We know it's linked to an, a compromised immune system. Um, but when you're lonely, you want to share your feelings. It makes you feel good. And there's a lovely study from Harvard where they gave human volunteers who'd done well a choice of the reward. Either they could have money or they would have the opportunity to talk about themselves. And instead of the monetary reward, they chose to talk about themselves. So next time someone wants a pay rise, just say, well, you won't get any money, but talk about yourself for half an hour. <laughs> and then that should be, that should be just fine. Yeah? Um, so social networking sites release dopamine. And we've seen what we know about dopamine. But now, whereas normally the body language is putting on the handbrake, now there is no handbrake online. There's no handbrake. So you are following your natural human tendency to want to talk about yourself. But instead of the handbrake, the counterbalance of body language, which ensures you only open up and confide in people who are nodding and smiling and patting you on the arm, now off you go, talking away. So no wonder you now are trading your privacy, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that later, in favor of now making the real you more vulnerable. You're more vulnerable to bullying. And so what do you do? So what you do is you conceal the real you and you invent a new you that has boyfriends and girlfriends and parties every night and is beautiful and is always happy. Um, and so the real you atrophies and is lonely. So this is a rather unfortunate cycle. This real you is now more vulnerable. And people now are concerned about the impact on mental health, as I'm sure you're aware. Recently, a former Facebook executive here um, said, 
The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops we've created are destroying how society works, and Sean Parker, who was a founder member of Facebook, Facebook literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. It probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Okay, and this was from the British government. There's a whole booklet, if you like, pie charts and histograms, which relates to the future of identity. This shows that even the government have woken up to explore the impact of this new world on how we see ourselves. So who is this real you? Um, is it now that we're going to have a much more fragile real you because this real you is very open and vulnerable, but at the same time desperately needs approval, desperately needs confirmation, desperately needs not friends, but an audience. Okay, so um, advertisers have got onto this, the fact that uh, we like um, expressing ourselves and being seen um, as uh, exciting and important people. The father of spin, who's a guy called Bernays, who's the nephew of Freud, latched on in the 1920s to get young women to smoke cigarettes by saying, it's the torch of freedom. Not smoking cigarettes is great fun. No, it, it says something about you. It's the torch of freedom. And later, this Betty Crocker cake mix, which was uh, in the States and in the UK, it wasn't selling very well until they changed things. And what they changed was that you had to add your own egg. And by adding your own egg, you were now doing something creative and personal. So these products say something about you or help you express your individuality, and they have great appeal because we're very sensitive to that. Um, you can even Google, as individual as you are, and you see the products that will make you an individual. Here you are, they make you individual. Um, the problem is you find your neighbor has got the same thing and then you have this arms race of individuality, so that doesn't really help. Nowadays, people have other ways of trying to become individual. Um, tattoos from this person, Zara Barry. My tattoos remind me of who I am, like you need to be reminded. Um, when I start to feel my identity getting blurred in the thick of life, they root me when I start to lose myself. They're about memorializing something so important it needs to be engraved on my skin. That's a rather strange. And then Johnny Depp, my body, my body is my journal and my tattoos are my story. My story notice, my life story. Okay, so surely a better alternative is this. Why not, instead of buying things and inking your skin, why not have an inner narrative, your inner identity, the very identity, the very life story um, that we explored at the beginning? And I think traditionally children have done this by that magic invitation. Let's make up a game. Let's make up a game. And this, this is magic. And this is, if you touch it, this will happen and that will happen. Or oh, this box is a castle. No, it's not. It's a spaceship. No, it's not. It's a racing car. And you have this wonderful, wonderful ability, not just to use your imagination, but you are in control. You are driving it. You are rehearsing effectively a little life story when you're doing this. And by rehearsing a life story, you are giving yourself the confidence to have an inner identity that is more robust than um, having a tattoo or owning something. Okay, so finally, search engines. What can we say about, well, you may be familiar with the, the distinction of crystalline versus fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence, which rather depressingly, as you can see, peaks in young adulthood, is actually the kind of intelligence where you can give correct answers to a given input. Dare I say it, it's what is good about computers. You put an input, you get a right output. Well, kids can learn things very well, but they don't understand them. My small brother, who's 13 years younger than me, when uh, he was three and I was 16, I forced him to learn Shakespeare. I thought that was very funny. So his poor little three-year-old had to learn Macbeth, okay? And there's a, a, there's a line in Macbeth, out, out, brief candle, life is but a poor player. And had you said to him, Graham, what does that mean? He would have said, oh, I have a candle on my birthday cake and I blow it out. He wouldn't have seen it as a metaphor for death. So that is fluid intelligence. Learning, he probably learned Macbeth much faster than any older person would. He didn't understand it. Crystalline intelligence, as its name suggests, is as you get more and more connections, like a crystal, but these are between neurons. And what that enables you to do is to relate what is coming along, whether it's an experience or an object, just like the ghost or the wedding ring, to points of reference. So now you can relate it. You can see one thing in terms of something else. And that is what I suggest is understanding. And that's because something has a meaning. You put it into the context of this crystal, of your brain cell connections. So these two distinctions, I'd suggest, are between information and knowledge. And people often confuse the two. Einstein said, information is not knowledge. And this 
the only source of knowledge is experience. Experience gained, what does it do? It makes those connections in your brain. And that is what gives you um, knowledge and insight. So, so if you take something like honor, if you try to explain to someone what, what is honor, um, a very abstract and complex concept. If you Google on it, this, you get the queen up first, obviously, if it's England, you get that. Um, you get these other things. Now, if, a, if you try to show to a Martian what honor was, would that help them understand what honor was? I would suggest reading Dartha by Mallory or books by experiencing people behaving honorably, by living your life, where gradually you get a sense of what honor and honorable is, is a much better way of doing it than looking at pictures. Um, similarly, when you're on the screen, um, let's compare. Um, do you actually care about the characters, for example, in a video game? Do you actually care about Princess Zelda as opposed to Princess Maria in War and Peace? Um, what's the difference? What's the difference between the two? They're both fictional. So why would you care about the princess in the book but not about the princess on the screen? I'll suggest to you the princess in the book, Princess Maria, is like you. She has relationships. She has connections, therefore, like you. She, therefore, has a meaning like you. And above all, she has a life story like you, a beginning, a middle, and an end, a linearity, which is why you're reading the book, because you care about her, whereas Princess Zelda is literally meaningless because she has no associations. So it gives you, by reading the books, you get a sense of meaning. And this is uh, someone who believes the same. I worry that overwhelming rapidity of information is, in fact, affecting cognition. It's affecting deeper thinking. I still believe sitting down and reading a book is the best way to learn something. I worry we're losing that. This is who said it, and he's the chairman of Google, or was. So I think one is legitimate in saying those things. So what will the mind of the future be like? Well, a short attention span, sensation at a premium, addictive personality, reckless, low empathy, a poor interpersonal skills, a weak sense of identity, Efficient at information processing, but putting a premium on icons and not abstract ideas, and therefore poor at critical thought. So rather than being like this, as some people think kids will be in the future, like little robots, no, I think they'll be more like this, like volatile three-year-olds uh, who are self-referential, um, who are easy to anger, who aren't very good at understanding interpersonal skills, um, have a who are addictive, reckless, and in fact, you don't have to be three years old. There's someone with the same hair color, currently depicted in a balloon floating above the Houses of Parliament, um, who could have this characteristic, who's a, a world leader. So, um, okay, so um, as you heard, uh, I, I, I draw parallels between this with what we call mind change and climate change, in that um, both are addictive, uh, both are global, and both are unprecedented. So what can we do? Let's think about how can we give people back with that mindset? How can we give them back an identity? And I'd like to suggest to you that what we want to do is shape experiences and give an environment where they have a life narrative again. They're not just sitting there responding to the screen, but they have a past, a present, and a future where they can sequence those things. So let's think about how we can give people back their extended present. This is a really interesting experiment. Um, which has a much more interesting point above and beyond the sheer plasticity of the brain, where uh, adult volunteers who couldn't play the piano had to volunteer, well, had to, they were asked to volunteer to undergo a five-day experiment. And if ever that was you, a word of advice, try and not be in the control group because they stared at a piano for five days. Whereas uh, the luckier group learned five-finger piano exercises. And what you're going to see are the brain scans over five days of how the brain changed even over five days with that. Uh, but there was a third group, and I'm going to keep you in suspense about them. So these are the controls going from left to right. As you can see, the brain is literally unimpressed. Right? Nothing's happened. Compared to these guys who are learning, can you see the change in the brain territory, as we've seen, like with, like with the taxi drivers, the change in brain territory because of all those extra connections being formed. But the most exciting group, and why I'm bringing this in now, is the third group were asked to imagine they were playing the piano. And this is what happened to them. Yeah, you have a look. So what you'll see is that as far as the brain is concerned, the crucial issue is not the contraction of muscle, it is the thought that has preceded it. So that makes us think, what is a thought? As opposed to a feeling. What? When you have a feeling, you cry, you laugh, you giggle, a dog will bark, a cat will meow, a mouse will squeak, but a thought, 
which really we have developed, most of all, a thought is different. It's not just in the moment. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, as we'll see. And the man, I should uh, congratulate you, an Austrian doctor who developed the treatment for the movement disorder Parkinson's disease, a man called Olaf Hornokowitz, he came up with this brilliant definition of a thought. He said, thinking is movement confined to the brain. Okay, let's reflect on that. It always has a temporal sequence. Let's think of a argument, where you can see this argument where two ends up equaling one. A equals B, B equals C, so A equals C. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Or a business plan it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and various versions. Or a story, Baba Yaga, the wicked Russian witch who ate the heads off children, uh, which I used to hear about when I was a little girl, and I used to tell my brother and make him cry about the... Uh, she, she, she's, she's my role model for babysitting. Uh, she, has, she has metal teeth. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, but all these very different examples are examples of a thought, a beginning, a middle, and an end, a sequence, yeah? And it's therefore important that we can restore sequencing because Nietzsche said walking, the very step of walking enforces the steps of thought. When you want to write, when you have a complex thing, you say, let me write it down, let me set it down straight, let me think straight. So we need to help people restore to their brain sequences rather than simultaneity. Simultaneity is shown here with multitasking. On the right, you can see there's a deterioration in performance. Instead of that, we want sequences. And we can do that, for example, with sport, because when you are engaged in sport, you have to follow a certain sequence of body movements um, in interacting. So you're imposing on the brain. And interestingly enough, physical activity enhances the growth of new brain cells. Here you can see that stress and aging um, are negative factors, but an enriched environment, experience, and above all, physical activity enhances the production of new brain cells throughout your life, throughout your life. Um, and you can see this in an experiment in mice where the ones that were running had more dividing cells and more newly born neurons. Similarly, even in older adults, you can see in the pink uh, the effect of exercise in age-matched groups in four aspects of cognition, hugely significantly better. So we know that exercise, the sequencing of movement, is very good for how you think. Now, if you can do that in the outdoors, so much the better. There's cognitive benefits interacting with nature. And uh, they've, one company have taken it. This is Microsoft. I wonder if you can guess what this is. These are Microsoft's latest offices where they've realized that being in a rural environment is beneficial. It's new outdoor meeting spaces provide the workplace and help employees connect environment and to one another. So they've recognized it. Similarly, we can think of things we do every day from hours through to months. For example, we were talking about cooking earlier. When you cook, you have to do it in a certain sequence and it has to take a certain time. You can't rush it or race it or change the order. Then when you eat, companion with bread, sharing of bread. And the ritual, you don't have the pudding first. You have the starter first, then you have the main course. So you have a ritual, again, as every anthropologist will tell you. Then gardening, where again, it has to be in a certain order. It imposes a certain time frame. All these things are recognized as beneficial to human well-being, and yet at the moment, they are not treated with the respect that they should be. We have to put them back. So how can we generate this individual life story? How can we give people back an inner identity? Well, if you think about it, that's why we like stories. There's this lovely quote from a British journalist about stories. From the moment we become aware of others, we demand to be told stories that allow us to make sense of the world, to inhabit the mind of someone else. In old age, we tell stories to make small museums of memory. It matters not whether the stories are true or imaginary. The narrative, whether oral or written, is a staple of every culture the world over. But stories demand time and concentration. Notice that, time and concentration. The narrative does not simply transmit information, but invites the reader or listener to witness the unfolding of events. I think it's lovely about stories. So the benefits of reading are that you have now a conceptual framework, not just your own life, but other ways of relating things. So you enhance the meaning as you look at other eras and other places. It enhances your attention span and your imagination because there's nothing there. It has to all come from inside you. And as someone said, imagination should be used not to escape reality, but to create it. And finally, a temporal sequence of thinking, which is movement confined to the brain. OK, very briefly then, identity takeaways are exercise, interaction with nature, eating together, gardening, stories, simple things that we took for granted until this century. 
Um, so finally, we come on to how we get this individual uniqueness. And again, a quote from Einstein, it's important to foster individuality, for only the individual can produce new ideas. And every business now is concerned with being creative and having new ideas. That's the one thing you can't buy. So what do we know about creativity? Well, Isaac Asimov, back in 1964, said, in 2014, mankind will suffer badly from the disease of boredom. And the lucky few who can be involved in creative work of any sort will be the true elite of mankind, for they alone will do more than serve a machine. Surely want everyone to be like that, everyone to be creative and fulfilled. So very briefly, the three steps I would suggest to creativity. The first, necessary but not sufficient. You have to deconstruct, you have to challenge dogma, as this kid's little painting of a sheep. She's challenged dogma because the sheep's got a purple face and a red body, but it's not hanging in any art gallery. You need unusual associations. Well, that's what schizophrenics do. Um, uh, they would say something like, sometimes it feels and smells like someone has screwed a quarter pound hamburger into my head and arms and legs. And if you shine a headlight inside, it will drill you. What they wanted to say was sometimes it feels like someone has been pounding on my head with a hammer. But because of the extraneous superfluous associations, it comes out like that. But that's not poetry. That's not creativity. What you really need is new associations. And those new associations have to have a meaning where and the more extensive it is, the more you'll say aha. So what you want is something like this. You might not like Damien Hirst's sheep, but it does make you think and gives things a new meaning, which is why it's regarded as art, I think. So the ultimate goal then, Eureka, as in Archimedes, this is what we do in science all the time, join up the dots in a new way, see the world in a new way, because that, that overrides tattoos and kitchens and cake mix and everything in terms of being an individual. Thank you very much.